Hello, everyone, and welcome. So happy to have you here today. If you want to take a moment and, and uh, pop in the chat and let us know where you're joining from, we'd love to see where you're joining. When you do that, um, as you open the chat, I recommend that you choose the option to message everyone. That way everyone can see um, your chat message. And um, I'm, I'm here in Portland, Oregon, and it's actually a little bit sunny right now. So we are, we are celebrating uh, seeing the sun, which we don't have a lot of this time of year in the Pacific Northwest. Hello and welcome everyone. We uh, invite you to greet us in the chat. You select messaging everyone and tell us where you're joining from. New York, welcome. Hello from Portland. Just take a few moments here to let everyone get online. Right, Los Angeles, I like it. I bet you got some sun down there. And sunny San Diego. I see some people in some sun states. New York is cold. Hello and welcome to everyone joining. We're greeting each other in the chat. Remember to select everyone instead of host and panelists so everyone can see your messages. Florida, welcome Jessica. And Detroit, I like it. Lots of representation here. Joshua Tree. I love to recognize some names. Good to see some familiar faces. Looks like we have a nice group here online. So, um, before we get started, just so you notice, your line is muted. We do that automatically here, and this session is being recorded. Um, if you would like, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. You can also put them in the Q&A, and we will go through and, and review those questions as we go. Um, we always send out the recordings of our webinars to, to people who have registered, so don't worry about that. And... I think that's everything that we need to cover housekeeping wise. So um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Tennessee, I like it. Another New York City. So welcome everyone to our, our webinar today on an important topic. We're gonna be talking about cancer caregivers and, and also other caregivers and talking about how um, you know understanding uh, the needs of caregivers is important and also how we can utilize aromatherapy and other um, holistic supports um, to show support for caregivers. Oh, Kenya, beautiful. What's the weather like in Kenya? My name is Amanda Latin and I'm a longtime professor here at ACHS. I'm also the Dean of Aromatherapy and I'm really excited to be here with all of you today. Um, please do ask me questions. I, I love when people ask questions during presentations. It really helps enrich um, the experience and also gives me an opportunity to fill in any information that you all may have questions about. So please do feel free to, to interact in the chat during the, the presentation. So I have been a clinical herbalist and aromatherapist for close to 20 years now here in Portland, Oregon. Um, I've been very blessed to get to not only work in my own um, clinic space, my partner is an acupuncturist, but I've also worked with many other healthcare providers, both you know allopathic and integrative healthcare providers to bring aromatherapy into their practices or to create herbal and aromatherapy supports um, for their clients and patients. And I love that collaboration. I love helping to bring aromatherapy and herbalism into these integrative spaces. So um, I definitely have experience in the topic that we are going to be exploring today, and I understand uh, the importance of it. Let's 
So ACHS, American College of Healthcare Sciences, this is our mission and vision. Our mission is to lead the advancement of evidence-based integrative health and wellness education through experiential online learning and sustainable practices, which we are doing today and do every day. And this follows our vision of integrative health and wellness education is accessible to global communities, promoting sustainable and healthy futures for all. And we wake up every day and really do do our best to support this mission and vision and uh, love to see what it creates. So ACHS, really we're pioneers in online integrative health and wellness education with over 45 years as an institution, pioneering distance education, even before the internet. And then of course, embracing the internet and everything that online education has to offer. Uh, we've served over 10,000 students and graduates in 60 countries globally in every United, every state in the United States. We had the first accredited uh, programs and degrees in aromatherapy in the United States, including the first master's of science in aromatherapy uh, in the United States that was accredited. So we definitely live and breathe uh, integrative health and also live and breathe um, distance education, which makes it possible, as we demonstrated by our chat today, for um, people from all over to access this important um, information and education. Today, we are going to focus on a, a specific topic. So we're going to look at what is caregiver burden and what are contributing factors? What are the health impacts of caregiver burden? And, and why is caregiver burden awareness important? And then we're going to talk about how can we use aromatherapy as a holistic sport for caregiver needs. So I'm going to be going over these. Um, this is going to be very informative, but we are going over it in, at a higher level today. And I want to introduce to you um, a new micro-credential that we are launching today. Very excited to share with you. I've authored this micro-credential. And it's uh, ACHS Aromatherapy for Caregiver Burden and Professional Burnout. So we can often see these patterns side by side. Um, you may have opportunity to either yourself are a caregiver, and you may also be a, pro a, a professional that carries high risk for burnout, um, or you may be working with individuals who are caregivers or who are high risk uh, professionals for burnout. And it's important to understand these are really specific um, stress patterns. It's not just stress. It's not just anxiety. It's really something that affects the whole person and to understand how to help create effective holistic support plans for those individuals and to understand their narratives. So to understand their stories. So um, if you're interested in this topic, we, we want to share with you this new offering that we have that really takes a deep dive into both of these profiles and then looking at research around how aromatherapy can support them. So let's, let's just dive right in here today. What is caregiver burden? So caregiver burden... And this is a concept analysis. So this is still an evolving term, an evolving concept. It refers to the strain and responsibility experienced by individuals caring for chronically ill, disabled, or elderly family members or friends. So it's important to distinguish that when we're talking here about caregivers, we're talking about informal or family caregivers. So these are individuals where it is not their profession to be caregivers, where they are, they are related in some way, and this can be through kinship, you know, where they are, they are, they are blood relatives or, or legal relatives of the individual or friendship or, you know, through the community where they are providing care for this individual because the individual is in need of care um, and they are related to them in, in one of these ways. And that creates a burden for that individual. So I want to distinguish that that doesn't mean that the caregiver has a negative outlook about caregiving. Um, they may feel very passionate and positive and even empowered around caregiving. They may understand that this is exactly what's needed and they are more than happy and willing to provide um, that caregiving. However, it does create a burden and it's a unique type of burden that it creates. Um, so, but this, why is it important to look at this? Well, because caregiving is very prevalent now in our society. Um, 
21% of Americans have provided care to an adult or child with special needs at some point in the past month. And I, I'm going to quote here, but that comes out to about 53 million individuals. Just And these numbers are from um, a little bit before 2020, and it's expected that every year it's increasing. Um, and it doesn't have to be for a chronically ill individual, although it definitely can be. Um, there are many different scenarios where an individual may need to have caregiving. And so caregivers are all unique. They're not a homogenous group. They each have their own story. And caregiving looks different for each individual who is a caregiver. Okay, so as you notice in the micro-credential, we paired caregiving burden with professional burnout because there also are uh, professionals who in, are in these roles in different ways in the medical system or in social services, uh, things of that nature. And they're experiencing this through a professional lens. But these, this is a, actually caregivers are so vital to make our health system work because they fill in gaps that professional uh, healthcare or caregiving services uh, can't fill. And so, um, and it, it can be a small role where it's only a few hours a week. Uh, I think the average number is about 11 hours a week for caregiving for most caregivers. But in some instances, it can actually become a big part of that person's life. For example, uh, cancer caregivers have an out average of 30 hours per week of caregiving. And other profiles for caregivers that are working with dementia, dementia patients can also have um, you know, higher numbers of hours of caregiving per week. Okay, so we've established who caregivers are. These are family or informal caregivers, so they are related in some way, either through friendship or kinship to the individual that is receiving care. It's a very prominent role in our society, so it's needed, and it can range. You can be doing it for, you know, 10 or 11 hours a week, which is still a substantial amount of caregiving. Um, and in some instances, it can become quite intensive where you may be looking at 25 to 30 hours a week of caregiving. Um, so does anybody have any questions for me about this? Are you all recognizing this profile? Uh, maybe some of you are caregivers or you know people who are caregivers. So we're going to look at the burden. So this is the strain that this role um, creates for these individuals. Thank you. Yes, it is very familiar. It's a familiar story now. So uh, what are contributing factors to caregiver burden? So this is really interesting where from the outside of these pictures, and for a long time, this is what was supposed even in healthcare, or in, um, thank you, Tamara. Love to see some feedback here. It can be easy to assume, and it was previously assumed, that what the care receiver was experiencing is what determined caregiver burden. Does that make sense to all of you? So from the outside, when we talked about what is the caregiver receiving what or experiencing? What is creating this burden for the caregiver? It was presupposed, and this is, I'm talking clinically presupposed, that that was created by what the care receiver was experiencing. I wanna see if you all are following me on that. However, that's actually been disproven, where there are certain specific profiles where what the caregiver is experiencing greatly impacts caregiver burden. And dementia uh, care is one of those areas where um, that is the case. But, in, but the research has shown that it's actually unique to the caregiver themselves, what is creating the burden for them. It is not tied to 
what the person they are caring for is experiencing, meaning the reasons why that person needs care, right? Um, it's multifactorial stressors surrounding the caregiving responsibilities that the caregiver is experiencing that create caregiver burden. And this is unique to each individual. So it can't be overly generalized. This has also been a challenge in understanding this pattern to be able to study it, to be able to then create effective interventions to support caregivers. Okay, so each caregiving role is unique. So even within that category of let's say dementia, care or cancer caregivers, or there are many other reasons why individuals need care, even within those subcategories. So that's that's in alignment with the care receiver. Are you all following me on this? And while there are some things that we can understand by, by following that pattern of this is the care receiver's pattern, therefore the caregiver is experiencing A, B, and C, that's actually not effective in understanding caregiver burden, okay? So it's important for us to take that hat off a little bit when we're working with these individuals, except for in a few key areas, and really listen to the narrative, to the story of the caregiver, and understand um, how this is integrating with their life. And so we have to know that individualization is central to, to working with this. Awesome. There is a lack of understanding in the community about what caregivers are experiencing. And some of this is because caregiving inherently creates social isolation. And so unless you, once you're involved in it, then you're really aware of it, right? And until you're directly involved in it, again, we can be, we can be on the outside looking at it and not really understanding what these individuals are experiencing. And because we don't understand it, it can be challenging to know how to offer support that's appropriate and actually does something. And I think there's a lot of concern about not offering appropriate support or not feeling confident in how to offer that type of support because there's just a lack of understanding of what the person, is, the caregiver is experiencing. If you've experienced it, then you do understand. But um, because caregivers carry this extra responsibility, they're not able to then cross pollinate, right? Caregivers, it's challenging for caregivers to support each other because they're kind of walking through the same path together. And there's also inadequate formal support. So within our social services network, within our healthcare system, there are not adequate supports for caregivers themselves. Those systems are predominantly focused on supporting the care recipient, the person that the caregiver is also supporting, which is the lens that we talked about. So this is starting to change, fortunately, um, now that we have so many caregivers and we understand that this is a role that's going to continue to increase in society, um, research is starting to catch up and an understanding that we also need to have effective support for the caregivers themselves um, built into these systems. And then hopefully that also broaches out in, to a broader understanding in our community, right? Because we all have to support one another. I appreciated all the thumbs up. I love it. I love getting, I like getting feedback from um, the people that I'm, I'm speaking to. So since I can't see or hear you, thank you for sending me um, those emojis. So these are all contributing factors. It's multifactorial, meaning we can't narrow it down to just one thing that causes it. It's not generalized. So each, each story is unique and what's creating that burden for each caregiver is unique. And also there's a lack of understanding for community support and there's inadequate formal supports currently. So this sets people up to, to have burden. What are the impacts of this burden? Okay, and again, I wanna, I wanna emphasize here that it's not just a stress or anxiety profile. 
Okay. It's not just, I have stress. It's not just, I have anxiety. Caregiver burden is more complex and farther reaching than that. Caregiver burden impacts individuals, individuals physically. Caregiving is a very physically demanding role. How physically demanding it is can vary from case to case, but that's part of the definition of a caregiver is that they provide care to this recipient physically. They provide care recipient to this person emotionally. They provide care to this recipient uh, medically, typically. Those are the three areas. So caregiver burden can impact someone physically because they it's physically demanding. So they can have um, fatigue or soreness, or they may feel like they are not strong enough to fulfill their caregiver burden role. So it can feel very physically demanding to them and that creates a strain. They can experience a wide range of emotional uh, fallout from caregiver burden. And this may, may or may not, it can be related to what the care recipient is experiencing. For example, if a loved one is chronically ill, um, there, there can be an emotional response to watching their loved one go through that chronic illness, but it doesn't have to be that scenario. They can have anger around, um, feeling frustrated or, or, or angry that they don't feel like they can fulfill their caregiving burden, their caregiving role, um, effectively. Um, they can also have fears or anxieties around, what the care recipient is receiving and whether or not they can fulfill the needs of the caregiving role for that individual. They may be also be experiencing sorrow um, around the situation. There can be a wide range of emotional impacts from a uh, caregiver burden. Now, supporting caregiver burden may not mitigate all those emotional responses, but it may help the person feel supported in processing them and reducing some of them. Perhaps we can reduce the level of fear that they are experiencing. Perhaps we can reduce the amount of frustration that they are experiencing. Yes, that's exactly right. How am I doing? Am I still connecting with all of you here? Are we, are we together on this journey? Okay. So we have, a, we have a physical impact. I love it. I love seeing that. Thank you for that feedback. We have, and I've done this before, and it is physically demanding, and it is emotionally demanding. It's also mentally demanding. There's so much multitasking that has to be managed. There is usually a high volume of medical information that needs to be processed by this individual. Oftentimes, they are filling in uh, doing things that typically a medical professional may be doing in terms of medication, in terms of maybe wound dressing that needs to happen, for example, or other aspects of medical care that given where we're at with um, the current medical system, it's not able to be completely fulfilled by professionals. And these informal caregivers have to fulfill it. Sometimes they're the one keeping track of, of, of the treatment plan or of what are the side effects of this treatment plan and trying to explain it to this care recipient. And they're not a medical professional, right? Um, so they, they feel a lot of responsibility for making sure that they understand what's happening and it's outside of their, their own um, skill set or their own knowledge base. And this creates a stress and anxiety imbalance because caregiving is also happening within this person's life. This is still, uh, the person is still experiencing life. Oftentimes they're still working or trying to work. They still have other responsibilities in their life and they're still, you know, the caregiving role didn't replace everything in their life. Um, it became part of it. So then they, they can also be balancing. Um, it can create a stress and anxiety imbalance because, uh, they are not sure if they can uh, fulfill these needs and this new responsibility. And then, of course, as we discussed, there's a social impact with their relationship with other family members, with their relationships with friends and coworkers and neighbors, because caregiving, as it stands right now, ends up becoming socially isolating. And because we don't have a real clear understanding of this currently, in our community and within these types of relationships, it creates a strain on those relationships, uh, both directions. The caregiver doesn't want to burden others 
and the people that care about them and have these types of social relationships with them aren't sure how to engage with the situation. And so the caregiver can become isolated. And then lastly, but not certainly not least, there's financial impacts of caregiver burden. Caregiving costs, impacts on their ability to work and maintain employment can be impacted, which of course we know can feed back into this mental burden and this emotional burden, et cetera. Any questions for me about this? So, why is awareness important? What we're doing right now, why is this important? This helps us to overcome mis misperceptions around caregiver burden. And I think, I hope the first one we started with is that the profile of what the care recipient is experiencing does not determine the burden that the caregiver is experiencing, that we have to remember to keep both narratives unique and both of them are important. But uh, now there is research that's exploring the relationship so that we can predict that, meaning when the care recipient is experiencing this, it is going to impact caregiver burden. Or when the caregiver is experiencing this, it is going to impact the care recipient. Because believe it or not, caregiver burden can end up impacting medical outcomes or treatment outcomes for the care recipient in some cases. So this is important to understand these relationships and to understand them both as individual narratives. We want to create effective supports that are individualized and timely. Okay, caregiving <coughs> changes rapidly, week to week, it can change what's happening for the caregiver. Their stressors can change uh, very timely. So day one and day 10 of caregiving can look very different for these individuals. And day 10 can look very different from day 30 or day 90 or day 120, right? This isn't something that's typically resolved very quickly. It can be but it oftentimes is longer term. And so supports that we do need to be um, individualized and also timely and frequent, okay? That's, that's also something that's coming out in research. We need to create supports at a personal level. So the caregiver themselves has to create supports. They have to take ownership of this and become empowered to create self-care. They need community support to help them do that. And they also need professional level support. So they need professional level support from the individuals who are also helping to support the care recipient. They also, you, we're finding out, usually need professional level support for them, for their care. It's uh, typically challenging for a caregiver. They might think about it. I know I need to do this for myself. But due to their additional responsibilities and responsibilities, it's uh, very challenging for them to actually have the time to implement those care, uh, care supports for themselves. <clears throat> so this leads us, <clears throat> excuse me, to the fourth point, which is personal empowerment through connections and resources. And <clears throat> some of these connections and resources are gonna come through um, agencies and nonprofit foundations that are being, that have been developed specifically to support caregivers. Sometimes they need encouragement though to access and use these. And this is where friends and family members can come in and help, or they can help open the door to uh, providing windows of opportunity for these caregivers to do the things they need to do to take care of themselves, to reduce their burden, which then enables them to fulfill their caregiving roles effectively. Okay, so this is why awareness is important. So I encourage you that if you have someone that's close to you who is a caregiver, to know that they do, in fact, getting a phone call and saying, how are you doing today? <laughs> what can I offer you? Sometimes they don't know how to answer. What can, what can you do for me today? And so um, listening to their story and, he and hearing 
what is causing them stress. Maybe they need help cooking a meal. Maybe they need help with laundry. Maybe they need help with running an errand or whatever that might be, or an opportunity to have a, a half an hour break. It may sound small. However, I want you to know that research is showing that that does indeed help. And, and having someone who can listen to them and, and offer um, solidarity, if you will, does make a difference. So things that are small in these situations make a difference. So I know the picture can be big, but uh, small support, small, timely, and individualized supports can make an impact. Yes, I have a question. No question, okay. All right, so this is why awareness is important. So I think we need a caregiver support day. I don't know if that exists. We need to, we need to research and find out. <laughs> caregiver support day, um, we need to start one if it doesn't already happen. Okay, so holistic supports for caregiver burden. We're starting here with awareness. Awareness makes a difference, all right? We need t-shirts to say, I heart caregivers. Um, awareness makes a difference. Give them a phone call, send them a text, you know, lots of, I, lots of small, timely, individualized things, short breaks make a difference in this. So if that's all you can do, don't tell yourself that doesn't make a difference because it does. Restful sleep. This is an area that really can get impacted by caregiver burden because their sleep perhaps their caregiver responsibilities impact their sleep routine or due to the mental and emotional strain, they may have a difficult time sleeping. And when sleep quality is reduced, research has shown a multitude of, of other health factors are impacted. So um, aromatherapy can be built to support restful sleep or help with creating a sleep hygiene um, uh, regimen for a person. But even a discussion to say that sleep is important and it's okay to prioritize getting sleep is important. And we'll count naps in, in restful sleep. Sometimes I think there's a lot of pressure on sleep looking a specific way. Um, but I think opening the door to allow the body to rest is, is key to what we're talking about here. Holistic nutrition, which we have many, um, opportunities to get education on here at, at ACHS. Holistic nutrition supports the caregiver physically and mentally. It sets them up for success for having the physical and mental strength that they need, um, to fulfill their caregiver burdens. And this is also an opportunity where we can offer support, can't we? There's There are so many ways to facilitate this. Now, it's amazing. You can have groceries delivered. You can have meals delivered. You can cook meals. And again, that may seem small, but it can it can create a big opportunity. This is one of the, these two areas are some of the most reported uh, that I'm talking about here on the slide. You wouldn't think it, but these are areas where caregivers report they don't they don't get opportunity to rest they don't get opportunity to feed themselves appropriately and depending on the situation it can be more than than we realize exercise is also a key this helps offset the effects of chronic stress getting regular exercise and exercise profiles for caregivers it didn't matter which kind of exercise so just getting an opportunity even going for a short walk okay, or getting to do a yoga session or whatever that might be um, helps offset it. It supports the caregiver's own personal health and helping to create opportunities for self-care. Yes, Res respite breaks. So if you're able to go and sit for 30 minutes and let that person do some self-care or sit with sit for an hour, don't, don't tell yourself it doesn't make a difference because it does. So aromatherapy is going to be, can be an important component of holistic self-care supports for caregivers. Um, 
Aromatherapy is a non-invasive, safe, very easy to implement tool for stress and anxiety management. And for caregivers, I think this is so important because sometimes they can also share the aromatherapy with the care recipient. And in some pro some profiles, that can be huge because it helps to create a sense of calm in the whole caregiving environment. It helps to, to support the individual that they are currently supporting. And uh, they don't have to be separate from the care recipient in order to implement the aromatherapy for stress and anxiety management. They can use utilize it to support their sleep. I have seen this successful outcomes for this many times in my um, clinical work where we implement the aromatherapy. The aromatherapy helps to reduce the stress and anxiety, which is keeping the person awake at night. We also have research evidence that shows that um, aromatherapy interventions help make it easier for an individual to fall asleep and improve sleep quality. And then upon waking, I also continue, you know, we usually have an aromatherapy support that's in, uh, easy for the person to use so that they can stay calm if, if and when they do wake up and return to sleep more easily. It can also be used for physical recovery support. Um, so aromatherapy can be incorporated in a multitude of ways. Again, this goes back to individualization, listening to what the person needs the most support with. We can individualize aromatherapy, right? It doesn't have to be the same aromatherapy. I know lavender is the most researched essential oil, but there are many other ones that we can work with to meet this person's personal, you know, their preferences and their needs. And it can be timely. So we can really build it in to their own routine and make it very accessible for them. And those hit the key points that we need to create a evidence-based uh, support plan for caregivers. Let me see what I have here in the chat. Absolutely, you can 100% incorporate it into meditations. There's such phenomenal apps now that people can get um, to, to help them come into a meditation where it's just very easy to have that guided meditation set up. You can do sleep meditations um, and you can easily, adding the layers of the multiple modalities like that is going to create a synergistic effect for that individual. And I love it because it, it's very safe and healthy. We're not adding another burden to this person's system, right? Um, it's very easy and safe to implement and, and does create. And I think that that's empowering to see that happen. I think that helps us feel empowered when we're able to do that for ourselves and see it work. Any questions for me here about holistic supports for caregiver burden? So some of you may not know what aromatherapy is. I know there can be a lot of myth busting around um, aromatherapy. I love that it's more prevalent now than it was 15 years ago. So aromatherapy is the intentional safe use of plant essential oils to promote health and wellness. Um, it's important to emphasize here plant essential oils. This is what these plants are producing naturally and we extract them through steam or water distillation, sometimes through cold pressing and sometimes through solvent extraction. Unfortunately, there is a lot of synthetic fragrance mixtures being sold as essential oils. And while yes, there is scent and scent alone can be soothing, certainly, especially if we have a positive aroma, uh, aroma association with it, Aromatherapy and, and these effects that we're talking about and, and what we see being achieved with aromatherapy in research is when uh, authentic plant essential oils are utilized because our body recognizes those plant constituents. We are able, they're able to interact with many different types of uh, cellular level receptors in our body to produce those effects. And that is different than how our body interacts with synthetic aroma compounds. So I think it's important to emphasize that. And uh, I believe we have a slide in here showing you at ACHS, we make all of the essential oils and herbs that we use to teach with accessible to the public. Our essential oils are organic pesticide free. That's very important. Um, in aromatherapy, we can utilize essential oils through several methods of use. 
including inhalation, which is the safest way to use aromatherapy typically, the fastest way for it to get into the bloodstream. So for stress, anxiety management, mood support, inhalation is usually the best way to go. But topical applications are also a component of aromatherapy. And we can do them in many different ways, you know, depending on where we might be doing respiratory support, we might be doing like low, lower back support, or we might be incorporating it into um, aromatherapy massage. Um, so Typically in the United States, we're either going to interact with the essential oils or inhalation topical applications. There are some over-the-counter um, standardized oral formulations of essential oils um, that can also fall under the umbrella of aromatherapy. Aromatherapists play a special role in integrative health. And sometimes we might not even realize it's there, but there are nurses who are aromatherapists. There are integrative health uh, practitioners who are aromatherapists. You see this, find this in chiropractic offices and massage therapy and acupuncture. Um, aromatherapy can be used alone or as a complementary modality that's integrated with other modalities. So all of that falls under the umbrella of aromatherapy, which is what I was talking about on the other slide. So why is aromatherapy a effective holistic support for caregiver burden? If you take, if you can take the micro credential I talked about, we also look at professional burnout, which has its own profile. There is actually some interesting overlap between the two profiles, um, which we explore. Um, but this is why aromatherapy is a wonderful tool to use for these specific types of stress patterns. Uh, one, we have emerging research demonstrating its effectiveness in, in these profiles. And I do think that comes down to the ability to be individualized um, and timely. Uh, so it supports, it, it, aromatherapy is able to be integrated into the other supports for the caregiver. It's very easy to use. It is not challenging to use, and that's so important, right? It only takes a few minutes to implement an aromatherapy support tool, and it, the person doesn't have to be in a separate environment. It doesn't require you know, a, um, a lot of time. It doesn't require a lot of additional equipment or anything like that. So it's very easy to use. It's non-invasive, and that's also typically very important in these situations and it supports physical and mental health. And I would say emotional and spiritual health as well. And I think that in the emotional and spiritual health can also be a big part of these um, caregiving uh, profiles. Okay, so we're able to support the entire person. Um, that's part of one of my favorite things of working with aromatherapy is I might design the aromatherapy for let's say the person has headaches. <laughs> That's something they might talk to me about. And we, we designed the aromatherapy to support their headaches. And then they come back and talk to me and they said, I had these big emotional releases while they were utilizing the aromatherapy for their headaches. And they realized the headache behind the headaches was a big backlog of emotional um, stressors that they had not processed. Or maybe they were in a grieving pattern and it, and it helped them to access that. So that's part of what makes aromatherapy such a beautiful modality is that it really is able to work with the whole person because it utilizes different mechanisms than other types of supports um, utilize. And it's able to go into the, you know, our limbic system and work with our memories and emotions, but it also has very real um, physical supports with our musculoskeletal system and different body systems. So this is what makes an aromatherapy an effective holistic support. Yes, I would say um, to the question in the chat that burning incense is part of aromatherapy. It's one of the original ways that essential oils were, were used was um, the aromat, the plants, the essential oil bearing plants were dried and concentrated into um, incense. So they may work usually typically mixed with some sort of fat and, and burnt as, uh, and, and perfume goes back to the Latin, um, which means, uh, through smoke. So yes, burning incense is part of aromatherapy, but we don't typically teach it that way because we, now we work with, uh, concentrated essential oils and we diffuse them. And so, that takes out the actual burning part 
of that. But yes, I would put I would put incense burning under aromatherapy. But that can fall under what's considered more to be um, aesthetic aromatherapy because you may not really be. It's harder to measure how much essential oil is actually moving into the body, so you're you're enjoying the aroma of it. Um, I hope that answers your question. But certainly, burning incense is a very old aspect of aromatherapy. So. That leads us to, how am I doing on time? I'm doing pretty good on time. Uh, this is our new uh, micro-credential that I was talking about, aromatherapy for caregiver burden and professional burnout. You can earn a badge, a digital badge, by completing it to add to your LinkedIn profile, to your resume, or other online profiles that you may have. If you work with caregivers or high-risk professionals, so professionals who experience burnout, or maybe you fall under one of these categories, I think it's a very informative and useful micro-credential. Uh, we talk about who are caregivers and we go into more on what is caregiver burden and the research surrounding that. We really understand what is professional burnout, which has just as much detail to it as caregivers. And that's something that also can be overly generalized and misunderstood. We explore the latest research on what is and isn't working to support caregivers and high-risk professionals. And I think that's important to understand what's not working so we don't try to keep doing things that aren't working. We look at specific aromatherapy strategies for caregiver burden and professional burnout with examples with an essential oil palette um, and strategies for how we might implement them to support different aspects of these patterns. And we also have created that supply collection which is available on our apothecary shop so you can we put together the collection of all the materials you would need to impl implement what's discussed in the micro credential um, again i'm just going to pause here to 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 feel the room and is there any questions um is this connecting with you any other questions for me about aromatherapy or about this micro credential It is self-paced, Teresa, yes. Lots of um, video lecture content, lots of, of additional, there's additional resources in there. Loving the hearts, loving the hearts. Thank you for that feedback. So we have additional opportunities to learn here at ACHS. We have a wonderful selection of aromatherapy um, micro-credential pathways. We have holistic aromatherapy for integrative health. This is like a foundational level one uh, training in aromatherapy. It's self-paced, it's fully online. Um, wonderful uh, micro-credential offering. So if you're interested in getting your foundational aromatherapy training and you wanna do it on, at your own pace, this is an awesome offering for you. We also have two uh, micro-credentials which focus specifically on uh, individual essential oils. And that is Buddha Wood um, essential oil history and clinical profile and white sage essential oil history, sustainability and clinical profile. Two really phenomenal um, essential oils that you can take a deep exploration of. And then we also have essential oils for memory retention. So this is looking at some of the neuroprotective actions of essential oils. So again, if you're working in the dementia care space, this would be a great micro-credential course to take um, to look at the late, latest research on that topic. That's awesome, Joanne. We can't wait to see you uh, this summer. Which class are you gonna be taking? Um, in our accredited uh, programs at, at, at ACHS, again, remember we were the, we are a leader in accredited aromatherapy education. We have four undergraduate programs that you can participate in, depending on your needs. Um, this starts with the certificate in aromatherapy. This is for people who probably are already healthcare professionals and have already taken anatomy and physiology, and they just want to get their aromatherapy training. Our diploma in aromatherapy, master aromatherapist is our comprehensive undergraduate aromatherapy training. 
it starts from the beginning and includes your anatomy and physiology. It includes your uh, business course, all the aromatherapy courses. Um, so it's our comprehensive program. And then we have two degree programs, which you can choose aromatherapy special specialization within. So if you do not have your undergraduate degree and you want to get your undergraduate degree, you can start at an associate's level or bachelor's level in integrative health and then complete the aromatherapy specialization within it, which would encompass this diploma in aromatherapy program. Well, thank you, Linda. Aroma 203 and Aroma 303 are wonderful classes. Yes, the White Sage micro-credential, I think that's such a special botanical. Um, I hope you all take the opportunity to explore it. It's also a very beautiful um, essential oil. And then our graduate level programs, I just wanna go over that. We have the first accredited Master of Science in Aromatherapy program. That's also comprehensive level three training. Our graduate certificate in aromatherapy, again, is for people who are already working professionals and have completed the air anatomy and physiology and just want to take the aromatherapy training. We also, you can complete an aromatherapy specialization within our Master of Science in Integrative Health program. And we are very proud of launching our Doctor of Science in Integrative Health, where you can choose an aromatherapy specialization. So, um, you can go, all of the details of all these are available. We can also uh, help you through that. All of our courses are uh, very hands-on and include an extensive court kit, course kit, and you complete case studies and lab practicals, and you get to interact with all of your professors who have clinical experience from different aspects of aromatherapy to work with. Um, it's an amazing experience, and we work really hard to keep these courses very current and, and uh, create a positive interactive experience for our students. Uh, I'm the dean of these programs, and I definitely put my, my heart into um, this education and do my best to uh, keep the aromatherapy legacy at ACHS strong. Um, we're very passionate about that here. So the best of the best is what you can expect in our aromatherapy courses from the supplies that you work with to our professor credentials and expertise to uh, we have an extensive uh, case study curriculum, which I'm very proud of. You will leave these programs knowing how to do aromatherapy and feeling confident, confident implementing it. It's very stackable credits. So you can start small and build out and you'll be able to have that accredited graduate level work um, to take into your professional life. Um, there are a lot of aromatherapy careers and opportunities. So you could start with something like getting trained in aromatherapy for caregivers and professional burnout. And then you could possibly build that into your professional profile if you want to. You can become a registered aromatherapist. Um, after completing our accredited programs, you can gain professional or clinical membership with AIA or NAHA, which has an amazing benefit profile and also can help you get liability insurance for your practice. And we've already discussed all the ways that aromatherapy um, can be implemented into the integrative health space. So the next steps would be, let's get you registered for this micro-credential if you're interested in starting to explore it. As I said, I authored it, so you'll get to be working with me <laughs> uh, virtually um, in the micro credential. And uh, we also have some amazing introductory offers uh, today for student and webinar attendees. We're offering 50% uh, off and um, also 30% off for friends and family. And we have these codes. Uh, this is available through March 31st, uh, 2024. So we wanted to share that special offer with you today. I'm just gonna check my chat. Awesome. So great to hear this feedback. And then if you have any questions whatsoever about any of the offerings that I discussed today, from micro-credentials all the way up to our accredited um, 
programs and courses, our admissions team is here to help you get registered and can answer any questions that you might have. If they can't answer your questions, then um, they can contact me and I can definitely fill in any, any questions that you um, may have. Um, Robert, those discounts go specifically towards the um, aromatherapy for caregiver burden and professional burnout. Uh, you could make inquiries with the admissions team about any other offer discount codes that may be currently available. It is a pretty good deal. I encourage you to, to explore it. So um, this is what we had available for all of you today. I just want to thank you for coming out today and spending an hour of your day with me and exploring these. Um, let me give you go back to the code page here for all of you. Here's the codes again. I want to thank you again for spending an hour of your day with me today. I really hope this was informative for you and supportive and piqued your curiosity to learn more about this topic. Please reach out to our admissions team with any questions. I want to see all of you in these micro credentials, and uh, hopefully, I get to see you and some of our accredited programs as well. Thank you all so very much.